If you could call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Baker. Here. Councilor Campbell. Here. Councilor Siomo. Present. Councilor Edwards. Present. Councilor Asabi George. Present. Councilor Flaherty. Here. Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Janey. Present. Councilor McCarthy. Here. Councilor O'Malley. Present. Councilor Presley. Present. Councilor Wu. Present. Councilor Zakem. Here. Madam President, we have ominous members. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. At this time, I would like all councillors and colleagues and guests to please rise as Councilor Flaherty comes up to introduce today's clergy to who will provide the invocation. I ask that you remain standing after Sister Hurley provides the invocation um, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to introduce our guest today, Sister Evelyn Hurley. Uh, who's uh, no stranger to the Boston City Council and, and no stranger to Boston politics. Uh, her father uh, was late Boston City Council, Bill Hurley, uh, who served as Boston City Council president from 1949 uh, to 1955, uh, and also later opened uh, Hurley's Log Cabin Restaurant, which was located on Albany Street. So uh, for those that uh, pass by the, the photos, this is a picture of uh, Sister Evelyn Hurley's dad that we uh, often adore in our thing. And, and our, and our central staff, uh, you Lady Valdez, did a phenomenal job uh, duplicating that photo. So we're going to send Sister home with the, the photo of her dad. So, um, so Sister Evelyn, uh, she made the uh, decision to enter to the Sisters of Charity in Nazareth back in 1932 after teaching for over a decade in Kentucky and several other, her and several other Sisters of Charity and Nuns opened St. Elizabeth School in Clarksdale, Mississippi in 1947. Uh, they were already serving the parish uh, in religious education when they saw a need uh, for the education of children. Uh, each sister at that time taught two grades. Uh, sister Evelyn took first and second grade, probably arguably the two toughest uh, of all. Uh, and after three years in Mississippi, Sister Evelyn uh, left and returned to her native South Boston, uh, where, would she, where would she would continue her ministry in education for the next 60 plus years. Uh, she is the last nun of the community of the Sisters of Charity in Nazareth in South Boston that was first set up on the convent in M in East Broadway back in uh, about 102 years ago. Um, anyone that has had Sister Evelyn uh, claims uh, to have been uh, her favorite student. Uh, <laughs> I happen to call myself one of those, but, but we're also blessed to have a couple of her other students. Uh, Kelly Dunham is here, Paul McCormick, and, uh, and Ellen Contreras, a dear friend of Sisters, came, uh, knew that she was going to be here along with uh, Ellie Casper Flaherty, uh, knew that she was going to be here, so they wanted to to, uh, to see Sister, and, uh, and if anyone has any special issues going on or needs any special attentions, grab her before she leaves. Uh, she's as, as close as it is to, to the guy upstairs, so, uh, and she keeps, I know me and the community as, mem as also the members of the Boston City Council in her thoughts and prayers every day, so. Uh, and lastly, um, Sister turned 103 last month. So. We are glad to have her back, uh, wishing her a very happy birthday. Uh, look forward to seeing her hopefully on her 104th, uh, but without further ado, uh, someone that has uh, um, a profound impact on, on me and, and my family and our commitment to public service, I present Sister Evelyn Hurley. Good morning. Good morning. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving and merciful God of us all, please bestow your bountiful blessings on our mayor, Marty Walsh, and on this special body of city councilors, particularly my former student, Michael Flaherty, <laughs> and their whole staff. And also give them the, your blessings of uh, compassion, wisdom, and especially heartfelt concern for all under their care, particularly the poor, the immigrants, the margin marginalized, and those with various uh, needs. And you know, I think it's time for all of us to take the time and become aware of the many, many countless blessings that all of you, that all of us have always and so often 
they just kind of go, we take them for granted. But I think that we should often remember the source of all goodness and thank him for that. God bless. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It was such a pleasure to meet you. Absolute pleasure. God bless. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty, and thank you, Sister Hurley, and happy belated birthday. And thank you to all those who came um, to listen to her special invocation. I really appreciate it. I'm going to give her some time to say hello and pass on blessings to my colleagues. And while they're doing that, I'm going to invite up Councillor Janey and Councillor Wu for a special presentation. Thank you. Uh, very exciting to, to see Sister, and thank you, Councillor Flaherty, for bringing her. Um, I am really honored today to once again bring Jazz Boston um, here to the City Council in partnership with the District 7 Council Office, uh, now Councillor Janey. So you all heard a little bit of their preview of International Jazz Day, which falls on April 30th of every year, uh, but we're always excited to, to continue this partnership of making sure that we're celebrating arts and culture with one of the best organizations uh, that does it here in Boston. So Pauline Bilski does so much as the director of Jazz Boston. I'd like to invite her to come up um, in addition to the, the band leader, where's Bill, uh, to introduce everyone and, and tell us a little bit about um, each of the members. And, but, for, but while they're coming up, I'm gonna hand it over to Councilor Kim Janey. Uh, thank you so much. So I'm just so excited to, to stand here as not only chair of the, the Arts Committee, but um, as someone who grew up listening to jazz. My, my daddy introduced me to jazz when I was a little girl, and uh, it's great to live in a city where jazz is celebrated, uh, particularly my district that has a rich history in terms of jazz. So without further ado... So there are a couple steps we're going to do. I, I want to make sure to present Pauline to, with her resolution recognizing Jazz Boston's exceptional work in promoting jazz to the diverse communities in the city and be it resolved that the Boston City Council hereby proclaims April 20th through 30th, 2018 as Jazz Week in Boston. Um, and we want to then have Pauline speak and we'll hear from the band. Uh, they're, they're going to play another song and then we'll all come up for a photo. Thank you. Um, President Campbell, Councilor Wu, Councilor Janey, Councilors. Um, on behalf of Boston's jazz community, I want to... Am I... Okay. Got it. On behalf of Boston's jazz community, I want to thank you all for inviting us back again for the fifth year. Um, that's probably long enough to qualify as a tradition. We always love coming to play for the City Council because we feel like we're among friends. You've supported and encouraged our efforts to bring jazz into the city's neighborhoods and to make Boston better known as one of the world's great jazz cities. That means a lot to us. We know some of the jazz fans among you, but we suspect that there are more, and we'd like to know all of you. Uh, two city council presidents in a row who love jazz. <laughs> that is beyond our wildest dreams. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Yes, of course. 
course. That would be great. Always calling the musicians. Uh, good morning. No, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, you have to do much better than that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. One of the joys of jazz is that it's for everybody. So the audience has as much to do as the musicians because it's an interaction, which is kind of what the uh, city council is like, right? We all have something to do, and what we have to do requires that our audience participates. So one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. One of the um, very important jazz organizations, uh, musical organizations here in Boston is a group called Aardvark, the Aardvark Jazz Orchestra. That's a strange name for a band, but that's what it is. The Aardvark Jazz Orchestra, uh, which celebrated its 40th anniversary about four years ago. And its leader is a trumpeter and pianist and educator and primarily a composer his name is Mark Harvey. He's also a reverend, Reverend Mark Harvey. And Reverend Mark Harvey is a devotee of a very important person in the world of music and I would argue in the world of um, people, Mr. Edward Kennedy Duke Ellington. Much of what Mark does musically comes out of Mr. Ellington. This is Ellington's month. Ellington was born in, in April, so we should all celebrate that. We're here today to perform, as we have done now, this is the fifth year, the, a section of a piece that Mark, in the tradition of Duke Ellington, a section of a piece that Mark wrote called No Walls. No Walls. Some people ba build walls, other people build bridges. Mm -hmm. Bridges are much easier to cross than walls. Uh, the funny thing about walls, by the way, if you build a wall, people will go around it and under it and tear it down anyway and draw graffiti. But it's so much better to have no walls. And in the, in the ideology, really, of inclusivity, we um, present no walls at the city council meeting in 2018. Thank you. Oh, let me tell you who's here. Ah, sorry. Uh, at the baritone saxophone, Mr. Zand, Dan Zupan. At the base, all the way from Bogota at great expense, <laughs> Carlos Pino. <laughs> and I think my name is Bill Lowe, and we're going to play for you just shortly and uh, let you get on with your business. Thank you. Thank you. 
If everyone can come up so we can take a quick photo. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, we have a second presentation, and Councilor Janey, I'd like to invite you All up. Right. So you invite we're going to yes. put this in the consent agenda. So thank you so much, uh, Council President. My guest, uh, in many ways, needs no introduction. Um, I, I'd like to invite Felix D. Arroyo up to come up for a special presentation. And as he comes up, I'll just say, a few words, it was so fitting to hear that last number, no walls, because that's what Felix has represented, someone who has built bridges in this, this community, in this city of Boston, someone who has been a trailblazer, someone who has been breaking down barriers. That's what he has dedicated his life to. I first, where are you Felix, come on up. I first met Felix uh, when I was working for a nonprofit and he was leading a nonprofit organization. And this was prior to him coming on to the Boston City Council. And what I really appreciate about Felix was his fierce advocacy even then. Uh, he is, as many of you know, he is the uh, first Latino to serve on the Boston School Committee. Uh, he was the first chair, first and only uh, Latino chairperson of the Boston School Committee. He was the first Latino to serve on this body and uh, was a great organizer in his efforts. He's been a fierce advocate, not just for the Latino community, but for all Bostonians. He's dedicated his entire life uh, to fighting for social justice, for fighting for peace, 
making sure that not just here in the city of Boston, but globally, he's done so much. Uh, he is a family man, a father, a grandfather. He has instilled the importance of service and activism in his family. Uh, and I'm just so grateful for your leadership. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when we have, you know, uh, a street in our city with your name on it. And I'm a big believer in, in celebrating people while they're right here with us. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you forth uh, is not just all the amazing work that you've done, but really to just celebrate and pay homage to you uh, in recognition of your 70th birthday. And so I'm proud to offer this resolution on behalf of the entire Boston City Council. Uh, everyone has signed on to this resolution, and we're just so grateful for your leadership. Um, I, 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 I won't even attempt to read everything that you've done. Um, it's, it's just, it's endless, your service to this the city and our community, and we're all so grateful. Um, I'd rather let you speak uh, and hear from you, so if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. And this is for you. This is Thank for you. you. Thank you so much. Signed by the entire council. I certainly appreciate that you will uh, sign on this resolution. I wish that you did when I was presenting uh, some of my bills here, but <laughs> 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 that's fine. Um, I want to thank Councillor Jenny for taking the initiative in doing this, and also I want to mention that uh, Councillor Ayana was the first to, uh, uh, the only one actually who be present at my celebration of the 70th, and I appreciate that very much. But I also know that uh, the president uh, uh, of the council and uh, the former president of the council also uh, were part of the host committee with Ms. Jenny, and I appreciate it as well. Uh, I hear Sister Hurley, and I was inspired to come back not only in my 80s and 90s, but to come back in my 100s, uh, <laughs> and hopefully as strong as she is. Uh, let, let her pray for me to be able to come here, and hopefully she will do the prayer that day. Uh, again, I'm very honored with this, uh, the 70s, and although I feel young, people in the bus always remind me, I know, young women, uh, tend to uh, stand up and offer me their seat. Usually I look around to see if there's somebody who's old, and then I recognize that it's for me. <laughs> uh, usually I say I better stay standing because that helps uh, my old legs to be straight <laughs> instead of bending them. Uh, but this is a great honor. I really appreciate it very much, and it brings me good memories of working in this council. And I think it has improved with your presence, the people of Boston know what they do. You are a good bunch of people, and are really uh, trying to make the best possible uh, decisions for the city. And I endorse it and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So I invite everyone up to come take a picture. I want a copy of the best one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Janey. Now for the regular business, um, on to the approval of the minutes. If there are no corrections to be made, the minutes for the last council meeting will stand approved. Seeing and hearing no objections, the minutes to the last council meeting are so approved. Uh, Madam Clerk, communications from His Honor the Mayor. 
Docket number 0613, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $1,750,000 in the form of a grant for the FY18 State Training Grant awarded by the Massachusetts Department of Fire Services to be administered by the Boston Fire Department. The grant will fund the, the PFD Training Division for FY18. This state earmark supplements training supplies and materials for the Boston Fire Training Division and Academy. Our docket 0613 will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Docket number 0614, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $255,734.18 in the form of a grant for the Nutrition Services Incentive Program known as NSIP, awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs to be administered by the Elderly Commission. This grant will fund meals for seniors. Councilor Presley, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, this grant is uh, essentially the same services that we offered um, that we moved to pass in a grant at the last council meeting, which I think really just speaks to the, the growing need for our seniors, especially our homebound seniors, uh, to receive uh, uh, meals, uh, but also to combat senior isolation by providing meals um, at community sites throughout the city of Boston. Uh, the portion of this grant money will support the Nutrition Services Incentive Program and State Elder Lunch Program, uh, which serves about 470,000 meals to 1,200 of our elders in Boston. And again, this program not only delivers meals to our homebound seniors, but also hosts group meals at over 45 meal sites throughout the city. As the Chair of the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities, I move to suspend the rules and to accept this grant today. Thank you, Councilor Presley. At this time, Councilor Presley moves for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0614. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket, 06, docket 0614 has been passed. Docket number 0615, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $237,500 in the form of a grant for the FY18 State, State Hazmat Grant awarded by the Massachusetts Department of Fire Services to be administered by the Fire Department. The grant will fund training supplies and staff expenses for the hazardous materials team. Docket 0615 will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Docket number 0616, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend a grant in the amount of $100,000 from the Bloomberg Philanthropies 2018 Mayor's Challenge Champion City awarded by Bloomberg Philanthropies to be administered by the Public Works Department. The grant will fund testing various ways to build equity in the city's approach to allocating resources for sidewalks and street maintenance by augmenting 311 dispatch requests with the data on community need, pavement condition, and usage. <coughs> Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. As Chair of the City, Neighborhood Services, and Veterans and Military Affairs Committee, I am looking to suspend the rules and pass docket 0616. I'd like to commend the Mayor's Office in the City of Boston on being named a champion city in the 2018 Mayor's Challenge by, by Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies. As stated in the order, this grant would be administrated by the Public Works Department in work to build equity and the city's approach to distributing assets for sidewalks and street maintenance. This grant will allow the city to augment 311 dispatch requests with data on community needs, pavement condition, and usage. This program will help residents across the city receive better services and help streamline maintenance. Again, I am looking forward, I am looking for a suspension of the rules and to pass docket 0616 so that the city may accept this grant that the Public Works may use this award to fund work that will improve the lives of residents of the City of Boston. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Councillor Flynn. At this time, Councillor Flynn seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0616. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0616 has been passed. Uh, petitions, memorials, and remonstrances. Docket number 0617, petition of local motion of Boston for a license to operate motor vehicles for the carriage of passengers for hire over certain streets in Boston. Uh, docket 0617 will be assigned to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Uh, reports of public officers and others. Madam President, would you like me to read from docket number 0618 through 0622? Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Docket number 0618, notice is received from the mayor of his absence from the city from 9.30 a.m. on Tuesday, April 17, 2018, until 7 p.m. on Thursday, April 19, 2018. Docket number 0619, communication was received from Keegan Worlin LLP regarding NSTAR Electric Company, DBA, Eversource Energy, DPU 17-147 of the notices of education. Notice of public hearings regarding K Street substation located at 500 East 1st Street in South Boston. Docket number 0620. Communication was received from the Boston Retirement Board regarding the FY19 retiree cost of living adjustment known as COLA base vote. Docket number 016. 0621, communication was received from the Boston Retirement Board regarding FY19 retiree cost of living adjustment COLA vote. Docket number 0622, communication was received from Brian P. Golden, Director of the Boston Planning and Development Agency, regarding the report and decision on the notice of financing pursuant to the Boston Garden Development Corps and the Boston Properties Limited Partnership Chapter 121A project. Docket 0618 through docket 0622 will be placed on file. Uh, reports of committees. Docket number 0332. The Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation, to which was referred on February 28, 2018, docket number 0332. A notice received from the City Clerk of the filing of the Greenway Business Improvement District, known as BID, petition submits a report recommending the petition ought to pass. The chair recognizes Councilor Rue, the chair of the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm very excited to bring forward to the floor uh, the Greenway Business Improvement District's petition for an official vote. Uh, this is the second time that Boston will see a petition to organize a business improvement district. And just as a quick summary, that is a mechanism in state law whereby uh, abutters to an area, either a, a downtown commercial area, in the case of the downtown bid near downtown crossing, or in this case around a park, come together to share the responsibility of maintaining and funding that park. The Greenway, as we all know, is one of the gems of the city. It is a little downtown oasis that is home to not just great public art and beautifully maintained open space that is done all organically and with the most sustainable, environmentally friendly methods, but they also take great care to serve our residents experiencing homelessness. They take great care to host cultural events that represent communities from all across the city and beyond and really strive to be that place downtown where people from every background in Boston can come to enjoy. Uh, we heard at the hearing from abutters who are in support, from the city, from the state, and from uh, representatives of the Greenway Conservancy itself, including the executive director, Jesse Brackenberry, who's here. Um, and there, we didn't hear from her, but we're also excited that Rachel Lake, an alum of the Boston City Council, is now at the Greenway. Um, we also heard from a better city, including the director, Rick Domino, also no stranger to this building, uh, Tom Ryan and others. The vast majority of feedback in this hearing and, and outside this hearing that uh, the committee had heard really fell along two different uh, points. One is that everybody adores the Greenway, and sees even greater potential for it to keep building accessibility, keep building equity into the mission, keep building its programming. Uh, and they want to make sure that in providing this sustainable funding stream for them, that the operations and that commitment to access and accessibility does not change and in fact only continues to grow. So we were assured by many parties that this will in fact enhance 
the Greenway Conservancy's ability to do that work and that this unique partnership, not just from the abutters coming together to add the tax assessment that will fund operations and maintenance, but also the city of Boston through proceeds spun off the Winthrop Square garage sale and uh, Mass DOT are coming together so that all parties are at the table and everyone has skin in the game. So I am excited to bring this forward. I hope that uh, my, some of my colleagues who are at the hearing, particularly the district colleagues whose districts include pieces of the Rose Kennedy Greenway, um, Councillor Ed Flynn and Councillor Lydia Edwards might consider speaking. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for their participation. And then after anyone is, everyone is done, I respectfully recommend that the City Council vote to declare the Greenway bid organized with the boundaries and service area set forth in the bid petition uh, as described in the proposed bid district and filed as an attachment to this report and that a roll call vote be taken and that this matter ought to pass. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Wu. Would anyone else like to speak on this one? Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Wu, for your leadership and making sure this got to the floor. I'm going to be very brief. I firmly support the bid, and I'm very excited to see this happen. Uh, the, it's the combination of both the private and public coming together to make sure that this is an accessible, beautiful greenway in perpetuity, regardless of whether we have an administration that is favorable or not um, for, our, um, for our parks and for our growth. Um, during the hearing, we had many questions, also, not only about equity, but diversity and making sure that there's a firm commitment, and I believe we have that from the leadership at the Conservancy, from uh, a better city, and they, they understood what we were saying and followed up consistently with emails and phone calls to make sure that the city of Boston had that commitment that went as it grows, that it grows for all of us, it grows in a way that all of us feel welcome, and it assures that it is not an isolated place just for the folks who work in and around uh, the Greenway. So I appreciate that, and I wanted to say thank you again to Jesse and your leadership. Where is Jesse? There he is. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you again for your follow-up on my questions. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just want to say thank you to Councillor Wu and Councillor Edwards for their strong leadership on this issue. Um, I want to thank Jesse Brackenberry and Rick Domino for providing great answers to our questions, um, providing a good roadmap for us to, um, to review. And I'm also, as Councillor Edwards mentioned, um, a good portion of the Greenway is in my district, and I'm confident that Jesse Brackenberry answered questions that I had concerning making sure that the park in Chinatown of the Greenway looks as beautiful as the Greenway in downtown Boston. So he made that commitment, and um, that's why I'm, I'm supporting this. Um, and I look forward to working with the Greenway staff to make sure we can continue to upgrade and improve the, uh, the park, especially in Chinatown. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Anyone else wishing to speak on this matter? Um, before we take a roll call vote, I also want to, um, in addition to thanking Jesse and Rick and Tom and Rachel for their work, um, the clerk, Madam Clerk, and the clerk's office for their work in this process as well. Um, this was definitely a, a joint effort, so thank you, Madam Clerk, and your incredible team. At this time, uh, Madam Clerk, if you could call the roll. Thank you, Madam President. Councillor Baker. Yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Councillor Campbell. Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Siomo. Yes. Councillor Siomo, yes. Councillor Edwards. Yes. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Asabi George. Yes. Councillor Asabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Janey. Yes. Councillor Janey, yes. Councillor McCarthy. Yes. Councillor McCarthy, yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. Councillor Presley. Yes. Councillor <laughs> Presley, yes. Councillor Wu. Yes. Councillor Wu, yes. And Councillor Zakem. Yes. Councillor Zakem, yes. Madam President, I am proud to announce that Docket number 0332 has received a unanimous vote. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 0332 has been passed, and um, we have accepted also the, uh, the committee report as recommended by Councillor Wu. So thank you. Moving on to matters recently heard for possible action. Docket number 0559 through 0563, and dockets number 0564 through 0565. 
orders for the FY19 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriations for the school department, appropriations for other post-employment benefits known as OPEB, appro appropriations for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriations for certain park improvements. The capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. Dockets 0559 through 0563 and 0564 through 0565 will remain in the Committee on Ways and Means. Madam President, would you like me to read 0568 through 0575? That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Docket number 0568, message in order authorizing the law department's revolving fund for fiscal year 2019 to purchase goods and services for repair to city property. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from recoveries for damage to the city property caused by third parties. The law department will be the only unit authorized to expend from this fund and such expenditures shall be capped at $500,000. Docket number 0569, message in order authorizing a limit for the distri distributed energy resource revolving fund for fiscal year 2019 to facilitate the purchase offsets of greenhouse gas emissions, which shall be associated with a portion of the electricity consumed by the city annually, and to operate, maintain, monit monitor, and expend the city's existing solar arrays and the Boston Public Schools combined heat and power facilities. This revolving fund shall be credited with any and all receipts from the sale of renewable alternative energy certificates and demand response program revenues produced by the combined heat and power units located in the Boston Public Schools sites and solar renewable energy certificates produced by the city's photovoltaic arrays. Receipt and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $250,000. Docket number 0570, message in order authorizing a limit of the Mayor's Office of Tourism revolving fund for fiscal year 2019 to purchase goods and services to support events and programming on and around City Hall Plaza, to advance tourism and to promote participation in public celebrations, civic and cultural events. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts for payments for the use of City Hall Plaza pursuant to the City of Boston Code Ordinance 11-7.14. The Mayor's Office of Tourism will be the only unit authorized to expend from this fund and such expenditures shall be capped at $150,000. Docket number 0571, message in order authorizing a limit for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture revolving fund for fiscal year 2019 to purchase goods and services to support public art to enhance the public realm throughout the city of Boston. This revolving fund shall be funded by the receipts from easements within the public way granted by the Public Improvements Commission. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture will be the only unit authorized to expend from this fund, and such expenditures shall be capped at $150,000. Docket number 0572, message and order authorizing a limit for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture revolving fund for fiscal year 2019 to purchase goods and services to support the operation of the Strand Theater. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from rental fees for the use of the Strand Theater. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture will be the only unit authorized to expend from this fund, and such expenditures shall be capped at $150,000. Docket number 0573, message and order authorizing the limit of, for the Boston Public Schools revolving fund for fiscal year 2019 to support the maintenance and repair of BPS facilities, including custodial and utility costs for extended building time, floor refinishing, landscaping, and building repairs, receipts from lease permits for the use and parking fee for BPS facilities will be deposited in the fund. BPS will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund, and such expenditures shall not exceed $2,600,000. Docket number 0574, message in order authorizing a limit for the Boston Public Schools revolving fund for fiscal year 2019 
to repair and purchase Boston Public Schools computer technology, including computers, mobile devices, and instructional services. This revolving fund shall be credited with any and all receipts from equipment sales and repair fees for Boston Public Schools technology. Receipts and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $1,500,000. And docket number 0575, message and order authorizing a limit for the Boston Public Schools revolving fund for the fiscal year 2019 for Boston Public Schools transportation costs, including bus and public transportation costs. This revolving fund shall be credited with revenue received by Boston Public School Department for the provision of transportation to groups and entities for field trips and activities other than transportation to and from school. Receipts and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $125,000. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Dockets 0568 through 0575 will remain on the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, Docket 0583. Docket 0583, message and order for an appropriation order in the amount of $759,663 for the administrative and operating expenses of the city's Boston Preservation Committee, known as CPC, for fiscal year 2019, and a future appropriation order in the amount of $21,200,262 from the Community Preservation Fund, known as the Fund, estimate annual revenues for the fiscal year 2019 to be appropriated and reserved for future appropriations. The chair recognizes uh, Councilor Siomo, the chair on Ways and Means. Thank you, Council President. Um, I rise to uh, recommend passage of Docket 0583. Our committee held the public hearing uh, yesterday. Uh, Christine Poff from the Community Preservation Director and Emma Handy, our CFO, testified on behalf of the administration. Uh, Docket 0583 involves two budgetary orders. The first is to appropriate funds for the FY19 administrative costs of the Community Preservation Committee. The second is an appropriation to reserve FY19 revenue from the Community Preservation Fund for further appropriation based on project recommendations of the, uh, the committee. The fund was created upon the adoption of the Community Preservation Act in November 2016, thanks to the leadership of Council President Campbell and uh, Councilor at Large Michael Flaherty. Uh, under, uh, and, and this is funded in part by the 1% property tax uh, surcharge on residential and business property tax bills that took effect in July of 2017. Under GL Chapter 44B, Section 6, the state CPA law, administrative costs for the CPC may not exceed 5% of the fund's annual revenue. The FY19 administrative appropriation in docket 0583 is for $759,663, which makes up approximately 3.46% of the almost $22 million estimated revenue for FY19. This will cover three full-time employees, contracted services, and various overhead. The rest of the $22 million will be appropriated and reserved. The Council will further appropriate these funds when it approves CPC project recommendations. The CPC is currently conducting a pilot program round of funding, which will award a small amount of funding to shovel-ready pro projects, $500,000 or less. The deadline for this round is this coming Friday. The CCP, CPC hopes for the Council to hear and approve pilot program appropriations by the end of this fiscal year, FY18, and then conduct a second round of funding for the fall. Uh, therefore, as the Chair of uh, the Committee on Ways and Means, I recommend passage. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Siomo. Anyone else wishing to speak on this matter? At this time, Council Siomo recommends acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0583. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could call the roll. Councillor Baker. Yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Councillor Campbell. Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Siomo. Yes. Councillor Siomo, yes. Councillor Edwards. Yes. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Asabi George. Yes. Councillor Asabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. 
Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor McCarthy, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Presley. Yes. Councilor Presley, yes. Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem. Yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, docket number 0583 has received a unanimous vote. And it's passed. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 0583 has been passed. Um, docket 0449. Docket 0449, order for hearing regarding the as of right zoning projects and exploring imposing notice requirements and other community informed conditions. Sometimes this works and sometimes <laughs> it doesn't. The chair recognizes Councilor Rue, the chairwoman uh, of the Committee on Planning, Development and Transportation. Thank you, Madam President. We had a great hearing last night on the hearing order that uh, you had submitted, and I was proud to be there with um, with you and with Councillor Janey at the Great Hall in Codman Square. We heard from residents about as of right zoning projects, and particularly, um, you know, it was a broad conversation, but there were a lot of folks interested in what happened with the Popeyes restaurant at 572 Washington Street, where it was initially denied uh, when they applied after a lot of community feedback that they did not want another um, takeout fast food restaurant, and they're trying to have more healthy options there, more of a sit down restaurant. Uh, and after the denial, then the applicant refiled under a slightly different permit and was accepted with an as of right use. The neighbors didn't realize, and there was there's no. It highlighted that there's no automatic um, provisions in place to either kind of tell people when something they were ca they cared about changed all of a sudden, um, or in and in, in the in the bigger picture that there are many as of right uses that neighbors would like to know about, um, and could we help broaden that? So we talked about two major areas, one updates to zoning and communities, not just in the Codman Square area, but throughout Boston, maybe wanting to change the zoning so that different uses could be streamlined and go in there faster as of right, but then others that may not be as desirable for the neighborhood would not be as of right, um, and uh, the longer process that that would take. We also talked about what would be within the city's jurisdiction to do immediately if we wanted to. Okay. Most of that involved changing how we do notice uh, and maybe broadening that. So right now, a lot of it is dependent on who's checking the Boston Herald for the postings you know, in, the, in that section, the, the automatic notice section, or who might be in the radius of 300 feet um, and is the land, uh, in this, is the property owner. So tenants who are in that radius don't necessarily know about it uh, unless the, they receive the flyer or if they somehow missed it, that they would have no idea. But the city only has a legal minimum floor of notice requirements. We could go above and beyond whatever, in whatever way we can pay for and would want to do. A lot of folks emphasize maybe going to more online notifications or consolidating them so you could search by neighborhood or reviving an email list that neighborhood association heads used to, to automatically get um, notices for permits filed that would affect their area. Some also talked about other cities having a requirement that whenever there's a project, as of right or not, the developer has to put up a sign that has the contact information and what they're planning on doing there. So at least if something goes wrong, you know who to call and who to contact. So my commitment as committee chair was that I'd help summarize all this and put it in a list that we could run back through Commissioner Christopher and Jeff Hampton from the BPDA, who wonderfully <coughs> stayed with us for all those hours and heard all the testimony. Uh, and we'll convene further working sessions with the council president um, to, to go through what is feasible to implement immediately. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Council Wu, and thank you for leading a great hearing last night, and thank you, Council Janey, for being there. And also thank you to my colleagues who couldn't come but submitted questions. Um, you know, we brought up uh, something that Council McCarthy brought up, the 300 square foot radius. We can change that. There's a possibility of uh, us changing that within our power. Um, we brought up um, some questions that Council Edwards had, some questions that Council Siomo had, or questions that came up during the initial filing of the hearing order um, around deferrals, something that Council Flaherty um, brought up. We didn't actually speak about it in the hearing, but it's something that I noted that we want to talk about, so we will do that in a working session. Um, and we brought up points even around uh, what Councilor Presley has brought up in terms of having an overwhelming number of the same type of business in a community. What can we do about that? But what was hopeful and why I'm optimistic is there are some things that we can do in the short term that are within the city of Boston's power, particularly around notification, making sure that, for example, when we send a notice out that it goes to the owner of record, but if the 
owner doesn't live in their home and say lives in Milton but owns a home in Dorchester, they get the notice in Milton but the tenant doesn't get it in Dorchester. Clearly we can change that. Um, if we have folks from the ONS department going out and flyering, maybe that's not the best use of their time, maybe it is doing this mailing. Um, we talked about language, what does it mean to actually notify folks in different languages? Some developers have actually been really creative and I know work with district councilors to actually do that, um, but how can we actually make that a part of what we do as process? Um, we also talked about the bigger picture of as a right projects that have a as a right to go into a space where there's no notification. But if you live in a community, we all I think agree that you should know what's happening in your community. So even though it's an as of right project, at a minimum should we at least have someone actually be able to, um, from our departments, send out a notice so people know what's happening. Um, long term has to do more with changing of zoning. Um, we talked a lot about how we have to interact with the state for those measures and how this body does that on so many different issues, um, but how we would need to come together around um, changing, changing the zoning code to maybe help residents and communities not only be more involved in the process, but actually have more say on what goes in their community. So how could we change the zoning code so that they don't get a lot of fast food restaurants in the community that is really pushing healthy living? Um, so there's a lot that um, we learned. I also want to thank Commissioner Christopher, Kim, as well as Jeff and the BPDA for coming. They stayed the entire time. We took public testimony throughout the hearing, so they got to hear directly from constituents and really listened to them and they did that and so I want to thank them for their participation. Neil as well from the mayor's office, he's also here in the chamber, thank you Neil for being there. Um, I also have to thank Michelle from Central Staff who, who helped us um, in my office um, with the drafting of the hearing order and research and tracking down a lot of different things so thank you Michelle. Um, but I look forward to the uh, next conversations, I think each of us has something to offer for this, and I think there's some things that we can do together to make it easier for us, as well as for the community when navigating these development projects. So thank you again, Councilor Wu, um, for leading this effort. If anyone else wants to speak on this matter, you are more than welcome. If not, the conversation will continue. Um, so docket 0449 will remain in the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Uh, motions, orders, and resolutions. Docket number 0623, Councilor Baker offered the following home rule petition for a special law regarding an act directing the, the City of Boston Police Department to waive the maximum age requirement for police officers, officer for Hugh Trong Nong. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so this is a, an, an age waiver to get onto the, into the police academy. Uh, we've done this a couple times in the past. This is just the first step here. It needs to pass here, go to the mayor, and then go through the, the, the House and the Senate, and then signed by the governor. But Hugh's story, Hugh got on, was in the last, was in the last class, um, and for whatever strain that was in his life, went to the command staff and said, I'm, able, I'm unable to complete this, but I, don't, I, I want to come back. They gave him an okay there, but they said, you're going to need a, an age waiver. And that's what we're doing here today. So Huey is, Huey's from Fields Corner. He's a BPS alum, mechanical engineer from Wentworth, and has a master's degree in criminal justice from, from BU. So um, we're talking about a qualified, a qualified person here. He's a Boston guy, BPS grad. And um, I do, would just like to help uh, this individual out get, a, get uh, his dream of getting on the police department. He just turned, I think, 40, whatever the age is, he just turned it in the last couple of months. So to get into the next class or the class after that, he's going to need this age waiver. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Baker. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter or add their name? Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Siomo, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Janey, Councillor McCarthy, Councillor oh. Presley, uh, as well as the chair. Docket zero, let me get this right. Docket zero six two three will be assigned to the Committee on Government Operations. Thank you. Docket number zero six two four, Councilors O'Malley and Janey offer the following order for a hearing to address summer violence and community engagement in the city of Boston. Council O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, first off, I'm like to move for substitution of language. The change is te technical in nature and the new language is on, uh, on everyone's desk. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, February 20th sticks out 
in my mind because if you may recall, we had that spate of really beautiful weather in the middle of February in this topsy-turvy climate change man-made driven winter, but it was 70 degrees in February <laughs> and all everyone was talking about all day because we had had such torrential winds. We didn't have as much snow, but, but we had terrible winds and the nor'easters and it was a beautiful day and that's all everyone was talking about. It's a great day, all oh, this, if I could get used to this, this is great. And that evening, I was at uh, Mildred Haley Apartments in my district, formerly known as Bromley Heath. Um, and it was their annual meeting. And I got there a little bit earlier, as I typically do for their annual meeting, and just sort of walked the perimeter with the tenants task force. And I remarked, as I had been hearing all day and feeling, boy, isn't this great, the weather's so nice. Uh, and a, a young woman who was on the tenants task force um, said, I hate this weather. And I said, why? And she said, because it reminds me what's going to come this summer. And I've thought about that every day since then. And the fact of the matter is, and I, I don't mean to create sort of a false panic or, or you know, make things sound worse than they are. We do live in a relatively safe city, but as the thermometer rises, so too does crime in this city and in every city. This isn't indicative to Boston only. So working with my dear colleague, counselor, the, the district counselor from District 7, Kim Janey, working with Horace Small, my brother from another mother from District 6, we were thinking about what can we do to address this issue ahead of time. And we had this idea of coming up with a hearing. This isn't going to be a contentious affair, but really let's talk about strategies before it gets to the summer. Um, last Friday I did a ride along with Captain Jack Danilecki, the night commander for BPD, as I do occasionally, and he had already mentioned, I asked him about this, about would this, you know, do you see the efficacy in this? And he did, because he said it, it's, it's some great work that Councils McCarthy and uh, Flynn and Flaherty have talked about, about jurisdictional oversight that can get confusing, particularly with the state police or with other cities and towns. It's about the DA's office, it's about paroles, about other public safety partners you, Madam President, have been working with. So how do we get all parties in the room, say, summer's coming, we know we're going to see some increase in incidents, what can we do to address them? What can we do to prevent them? What can we do to make sure that we're all on the same page going forward? How can we strengthen departments, you know, particularly the BPD programs that work, like Junior Police Academy, Text to Tip, Neighborhood Watch Unit, Community Watch Unit? Um, what can we do to make this city safer? So that is the purpose of this hearing. I'm delighted to partner with Councilor Janney on this. Um, hope you all sign on and offer sort of sp district specific insights that you may have. Let's bring all the stakeholders together. Let's talk about what we see, the trends that we see, what we've seen in years past, and figure out concrete strategies. Again, I have said it publicly, privately, I think we have the best public safety officials in the world in Boston. Uh, community policing was literally born here and it's done better here than any other city on the planet as far as I'm concerned. But let's get together, let's talk about what's going to happen, what we know, what we anticipate, and ways that we can work better and work smarter going forward. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Uh, thank you, Councilor O'Malley. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Oh, excuse me. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank Councilor uh, Matt O'Malley for his leadership on this issue uh, and all those on the council who have been working uh, hard to make sure that our city is safe for everyone, regardless of zip code. I cannot count the number of times that I've heard gunshots right from my own home or that I've experienced gunfire uh, walking down the street or that there's been some sort of incident in my own neighborhood. Um, I too have heard from many folks about their fear of what happens when the warm weather comes. And so, and that's a shame. You know, we actually had a couple of nice days uh, yesterday and on Monday, and spring almost came, and I guess rain is part of spring. Um, but as the weather gets warmer, more and more people are out. More and more people who have conflict with each other are out. More and more people who have conflict with each other see each other and incidents happen. And so I um, appreciate being able to uh, co-sponsor this hearing order. I think it is very important. I don't think it is sounding the alarm at all. I think it's very important for us to be proactive, um, not only how we engage law enforcement, but how we reach out to community groups uh, and other partners around how we ensure that our city is safe for everyone. And I think, you know, again, very important to be proactive. So very proud to uh, sign off on this as a co-sponsor, and I encourage uh, my colleagues to join us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Janey. 
Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I'd like to congratulate both the makers on this. As we all know, uh, we hear about the need to address summer violence in particular um, so often, but you know, we also know that this continues year long. This is a 12 month problem in all of our neighborhoods. Um, but as we get out of our, out of our winter hibernation, it, it just becomes much more of a reality. And we want to make sure that all of our youth feel um, protected and safe and that all of our residents feel protected and safe. Mm -hmm. And that we're also including as part of the conversation, as no doubt the makers will, uh, but a conversation about youth jobs and access to those jobs in the summertime, but also in the fall and in the winter and the spring, and that we're looking at that 12 months. Uh, that we're also making sure that we have a great educational and athletic and other civic programs for our youth, our young people to participate in, uh, but that we're also including uh, trauma services and mental health providers uh, to, to be at the table and be part of the conversation uh, to prevent and to address um, sort of the, the tragedy that summers can be um, anywhere in the United States, but for our interest here in Boston. Um, we also need to make sure as we, we talk about young people that it's not just the youngest of people, that the 18 to 24 year olds are part of the conversation because they're often too old for so many of the activities that we provide in the summer, but really too young to engage in, um, in other activities. And as we think about the, the impacts this has on um, very uh, small parts of neighborhoods across the city and the impact it has on families across the city, but also that it does extend into the community at large. It certainly extends into our classrooms across the city and what happens um, in our schools sometimes impacts what the summer will be like and then what happens over the summer unfortunately impacts what will happen in some of our schools come September and October. So making sure that you know everyone's at the table as, uh, as we look at this together, not just with our first responders and our police department, but that that community is engaged, as no doubt uh, the makers will, will do for this hearing. I ask that my name be added, and I look forward to this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sabu George. Councilor Presley, you have the floor. Like it's all been said. Um, <clears throat> I just rise to commend the makers. I wish to have my name added, and um, agree with everything that has been said, and I just, uh, uh, to the point that uh, this work is year-round, it is ongoing. We know that violence is a byproduct of many other social determinants and things that we work on year-round, everything from um, the affordable housing crisis uh, to the need for economic justice to addressing income inequality. You know, all of these things uh, contribute uh, to violence. I, I did just want to say uh, that I think very often our conversations uh, around violence uh, prevention, and we do want to ensure that every youth uh, feels safe, but I don't want us to lose sight of the need to focus on violence intervention, because we know that the majority of violence that does occur is gang affiliated, as Councilor Janie alluded to, that in the summer months more people are out, they're seeing people that they have conflict with. Another one of the reasons we see a surge in, in summer is not, you know, again, it's not just about a lack of programming or we're not meeting um, the, the summer job need and all of those things are true, but you find these are the anniversaries of many of the tragic shootings and it is a trauma trigger. So one, we have to be wrapping our arms around those surviving family members of those lives that were robbed due to gun violence in this city. Uh, last year, uh, we were robbed of 56 lives and the year before that it was 47. And we know that every life that we are robbed of is, is too much. But we did see an increase there. So it is important that we come together to kind of self-audit ourselves and be frank about, you know, what is working and what is working increasing capacity and what is it, um, you know, dismantling it in, entirely, uh, amending or reforming it. But, but I really just wanted to say in this moment, I, if, if every youth and every life is of value, I don't want us to lose sight of those that are already caught up. You know, those that might be gang affiliated. We've got to make that investment 
in those interventions. And a lot of that is about opportunity, which is why we've seen the success of efforts like Operation Exit um, to get many of these young men into the trades and getting a, a, on a career path that changes their lives. But if, if every life is a value, if every youth is a value, let's just make sure in this conversation that we are not forgetting those youth that are already caught up and might be gang affiliated and that we are just as um, invested and just as creative uh, about how to reach them and at the same time how to support these families. I'll, I'll end here just to give an example and it's a controversial issue and I have grappled with uh, impacted uh, community members about how to handle this. But these street memorials that we have throughout the city, you know, personally I think they're an incredible trauma trigger. But I think our families who don't know where else uh, to uh, celebrate the life of their loved one or to mourn them uh, create these vigils. And there's a family that I've worked with for a number of years, um, uh, the Perry family. Uh, Annalisha Perry went on the anniversary of her brother's murder to that vigil. And she was gunned down um, on the anniversary of that vigil because people that had conflict and knew that that was the anniversary came. So this mother lost her son and her daughter on the same day, uh, four years apart. Uh, and now, you know, that little girl, uh, the, because uh, Annalisha had a two-year-old daughter that was with her at the time, and she's now a, a teenager. But, you know, this just, this is generational trauma. It just reverberates. So, you know, I don't know the street memorials will be a part of that, and I know we've been working with the city to now put a timeline on how long those memorials can be up, that it not exceed two weeks, that we work with families to give them pictures and things from that in a very respectful way. Um, but in any event, I've gone on for too long, but I just rise to commend the makers. I wish to have my name added, and, um, and I hope you'll, you'll take to heart what I've said about remembering those youth that are already caught up. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Madam Clerk, if you could add uh, Councilor Presley's name, Councilor Sabi George's name, Councilor Baker, Councilor Siomo, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor Wu, Councilor Zakem, as well as the chair. I, I will just add, um, and I don't know if this is specifically in the hearing order, um, the, in, we were having some of these conversations last year with the Black Ministerial Alliance. Um, the BPD Grants Division is also a great resource. They have a lot of our grants. They manage a lot of our grants that often go not just to young people or families, but to organizations that serve youth. So it would be great to engage them as well, Councillor Janey and um, O'Malley. And then lastly, um, in Dorchester, and I'm sure this is present in other neighborhoods, folks who are solution Oriented. I think that's who you want to be a part of the conversation. Um, Paul from TNT leads a monthly um, Dorchester Public Safety Coalition meeting where everyone that touches public safety is in the room and they meet right at the Great Hall in Dorchester um, once a month. And they're about moving things forward. It includes housing folks, the DA, um, DCF, you name it. And so I think they're also a great group of folks to engage with as you do this work and as we do it in partnership with you. So thank you, Council O'Malley and Councilor Janey. Um, Doc, Docket 0624 will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Docket number 0625, Councilors oh. Campbell and McCarthy offer the following order for a series of policy briefings to explore and recommend diversity initiatives for the City of Boston's public safety agencies. Chair recognizes Council President Campbell. Uh, thank you, Councillor Siomo. Um, before I start, uh, I would like to substitute new language. We had some um, corrections to some of the data, um, so I'd like to substitute new language for what was in the file folder that we received. Any objections? Seeing none, proceed. Thank you. Um, first, I want to start with thank yous, and I want to thank Council McCarthy, who is taking this on with me. Um, I also want to thank the, the mayor and the administration. I, I mentioned that Council McCarthy Council McCarthy and I wanted to tackle this in a meaningful way um, and said that we would start not just policy briefings but do a, almost like a working group that would meet regularly um, and he immediately said okay well how do, how do we support you in that um, so I want to thank the administration as well as the departments including some of our diversity officers um, and Laura who is not a diversity officer but works for EMS um, for getting us this updated data that you see in the um, 
in the hearing order. I also want to thank Michelle from Central Staff again um, for navigating this and getting new numbers and putting in new numbers and adding and subtracting and calculating. So thank you, Michelle, for your hard work on this as well. Um, this is an opportunity, I think we've been talking about this issue of diversity in our law enforcement and public safety agencies for some time. Um, and we've seen the numbers change somewhat and I have to applaud the efforts of the fire department, the police department, as well as EMS, um, particularly when it comes to the hiring of some diversity officers who are doing meaningful work and want to move the needle forward. Um, but also some creative work that's being done with, say, um, the Office of Workforce Development with Trin's uh, shop and EMS to actually get folks into the fold early on um, to become EMS technicians. And so there's some incredible things going on. So this is an opportunity, one, to highlight that work, which most people don't even talk about, but then also to say, what else could we be doing so that two, three, four, five years from now, when we look at the numbers for our public safety agencies, they're representative of the city of Boston's population. And not just for folks of color, but also for women. And not just at the low tier, bottom ranked positions, at the entry level, at the top positions. When we're talking about our commissioners, our lieutenant our lieutenants, our captains, um, how do we make sure that folks who come into our public safety agencies are also being promoted um, and moved up in the ranks. And so there's a lot of work to do here. Um, I think the numbers are clear and, and they're all spelled out in the hearing order, but if you look at the numbers for those who are coming in at the entry level, they're doing, we're okay, but we can do better. And if you look at those who are at the top tier levels in terms of the captains and the higher ranking positions, we have to do much better. Um, and one thing I will add to this that isn't necessarily reflected in this hearing order, I saw Councilor Linehan this morning, so I have to mention him. Um, we uh, obviously filed a hearing order together related to the fire cadet program. Um, in the city of Boston and exploring the possibility of having a cadet program for the fire department, um, similar to the cadet program for the police department. Um, after filing that, I had a lot of people yelling at me and some applauding me. Um, a lot of folks that might have been yelling might have been veterans. I engage with some of my veterans, and one of which actually lives in my district, and I've learned a great deal from, her, from him, and I've actually asked him to participate in this working group and be a part of this, and he's excited. I think this is an opportunity for us to not just do it as Linehan and I were talking about in the fire department or, or one department at a time. How do we bring all of our public safety agencies together so they can share what's working in each, each of their respective departments? How do we engage folks, not just our veterans, not just folks from community of color, but even those young folks who were born and raised in the city of Boston and who want to get on the force or who want to become a firefighter or a police officer and who aren't able to make it. Um, this veteran that I just spoke of who lives in my district says that might require that we study the civil service and the impact it has on the city of Boston. We save a lot of money, I think, by using civil service, which is managed by the state. Um, for the city of Boston, but maybe that doesn't work for us anymore. Um, but I think it's a, this is an opportunity for us to explore that. And so I look forward to participating, not only in the conversations, but doing a lot of listening, um, and also hopefully engaging, whether it's some of our institutions, educational institutions, um, and pulling on their research capabilities to look at what's happening across the country when it comes to um, work this particular issue. What are other cities doing that might be making a dent, that might be in increasing the number of women, increasing the, the number of folks of color? Um, and what might we be able to adopt or copy? Um, and if they're not doing much or not making a dent, then we have an opportunity to truly lead on this important issue. And I'm excited to do that in partnership with Council McCarthy, but also in partnership with all of you, as well as Commissioner Finn, Commissioner Evans, Chief Hooley, who've all been very helpful in putting this hearing order together, and Trin from the Workforce Development Shop, who's been doing some really amazing work um, around some barriers that might currently exist for us to improve these numbers. Um, so I look forward to working with each and every one of you, and thank you, uh, Councilor McCarthy, and thank you, Councilor Sioma. Thank you. I need more than Okay. <laughs> Council, Pre uh, Councilor Presley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to, when our, our, you know, our good colleague, uh, Councilor Flaherty, I, I believe uh, filed a hearing order about this, uh, not the diversity side, but really it speaks to the larger issue. I just want to say this, that, so in a recent interview, Commissioner Evans 
um, uh, shared that in terms of, we know the force, you know, is very dedicated. We thank our dedicated, uh, you know, men and women in blue. Um, but the force is aging and people are retiring at a very fast rate. They're reaching retirement age. And so by um, 2017, there were 272 officers that were eligible for retirement. 2018, 370 officers eligible for retirement. 2019, 458 officers are eligible for retirement. When you look at staffing levels, current staffing levels are at 2,136. Now the commissioner wants that to be at 2,185. But for as long as we're operating at 2,136, and we have so many officers that are arriving at retirement age, we're going to continue to have a very heavy reliance on overtime. So one, this is about public safety. Uh, two, this is about more effective community policing. It's appropriate that the previous order came right before this one. Um, you know, when the city is 53% people of color, we have to have a force that is more representative, both in gender and in race. And if we are serious about addressing income inequality and the wealth gap, these are good jobs. The average base pay is $60,315. That is not including bonuses and over bonuses, benefits, and overtime. So we have to get this straight, you know, first and foremost, because any room where there isn't diversity that is not inclusive and representative, there will be blind spots and biases. You know, so uh, I filed my first hearing order on this topic in 2010, and I know there were many counselors before me that came and were advocating in this space. And here we are, 2018, when the city's diversity only continues to grow, and women are half of the population, and this continues to be a nagging and persistent problem. So, you know, I am encouraged that the, the body and the collective, and I commend the makers and wish to have my name added, enthusiastically so, um, want to take this on. Um, again, this is in the interest of public safety, more effective community policing, and fairness uh, to ensure that everyone has an equity and opportunity um, to get access to these good jobs so that we can make a demonstrated commitment in action uh, to address income inequality and the wealth gap in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Presley. Please add Council Presley's name and assign docket 062. Oh, I'm sorry. Council, please add Councilor Baker's name, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Janey, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Wu, and Councilor Zakem, and please add uh, my name as well. I'm sorry, Mr. Vice President, I'm sorry, one more thing. I just wanted to ask that you please, I'm sure you will, I'm glad you're including veterans groups because of the veterans preference piece, but please do include uh, the Vulcans and Mamlio. Yes. I want to thank them very much for their leadership in this space. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. And we've actually reached out to make sure that they knew this was coming along with um, other um, community-based organizations as well. So thank you, Council Presley, thank and you. thank you for your words and your work on this as well. Um, moving on to docket 0626. for property tax arrears. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Good afternoon, all. I, um, I just wanted to uh, start off the explanation of this, I don't think it's actually that complicated, this tax relief that we could be providing for our uh, Boston residents with a simple story. Uh, a man with uh, mental health issues um, inherited a, um, a six family in the North End, and um, in that process, and having no family and, and, and being somewhat of a shut-in, uh, had stopped paying taxes at a certain point, self-declaring himself um, disabled, and then deciding that he didn't have to pay taxes. Um, he clearly, uh, ha having no family and having no one to guard for him, he went for years without paying taxes, owning the six-family home, and eventually ended up owing the city of Boston $200,000. Now, six-family in the North End is certainly worth more than that. But he was about to lose it all and be homeless because the city could had he had entered into the foreclosure mark for the city of Boston. And in order for him to get out of that, uh, many people don't realize you have to pay 
as a down payment for the city to the taxes, and then also uh, pay off all of the remaining taxes within one year. That's a, that's a heavy lift for someone who lives by themselves who really doesn't understand what's happening to him. The good news is he came, or REMS, from DND, which is real estate management uh, systems. I happened to be working with him when I was at the Office of Housing Stability, approached and said, you know, we really don't want to be in the process or in this business of displacing people who owe the city taxes, especially this man. We went through, we got him an attorney, we got him a conservator, but ultimately, in order to pay back the taxes, we were going to have to sell the house. He was no longer going to be able to own it. We did the best thing we could to give him the soft landing that he deserved. We found somebody who could purchase the home and keep him in that home. He became a millionaire overnight, still don't know that he's aware of that. And we, found it, we managed to find someone who is a conservator to make sure his bills are paid on time. He now goes to the hospital. He refused to eat anything besides pasta. I mean, he was very, 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 not that that pasta is a bad thing, not that carbs are a bad thing, uh, but he didn't eat anything else. He didn't eat anything else. And almost uh, had to be committed to the hospital in the middle of us trying to even help him out. What we're finding oftentimes, and what I found with my colleagues in, in REMS, is that a lot of people are falling into tax arrears, and many of them are house rich, cash poor. Many of them are hoarders. Many of them are isolated, many of them do have mental health issues, and many of them are vulnerable seniors. And so what that means with the way our, our system works is when REMS comes in, they can do everything they can to try and help this person, but often in the pre-foreclosure um, efforts. But once they enter into the foreclosure efforts from the city, they have one year, and they have to pay 25% as a down payment. And in that year, interest is 16%. And we can do better as a city of Boston. And thank goodness the state has already taken the lead in that the state has passed an opt-in provision that Springfield and New Bedford and other cities have already taken advantage of. This opt-in allows for municipalities to extend that one year to up to five years to repay the taxes. And if you can repay your taxes within that five years or, or less, you can reduce your t uh, interest by 50%. This is a huge relief. And I see it as really just an additional tool in the toolbox for the city of Boston to make sure that our residents can stay here. We really are dealing with uh, a displacement crisis. I had a call just the other day. Someone's mother-in-law owes $50,000 to the city of Boston. She's 88. She would love nothing more for her grandchildren to inherit the house. She has no idea what she's going to do to pay it in one year with 25% on SSDI. She's also frightened to come forward. Mm -hmm. Because if she does, she feels like that'll trigger the foreclosure, and then she really, really will lose her house. So again, we shouldn't have people frightened to do right and pay their taxes. We shouldn't have people running away from their obligations. We should be providing mechanisms and reasonable tax payment plans. This is something we can do as the city of Boston. It's an opt-in for us as the city council to simply vote and pass with, of course, the support of the mayor. So. I hope that we, I am asking for a hearing order because we get to craft it. Who it's going to apply to? Will it be to our seniors? Will it be to our folks who are low income? Could it be to some businesses, licenses? We get to apply, we get to also discuss how many years it's going to apply for and how much of the interest we're going to forgive. That's a robust conversation and I'm so happy the assessor's office was here testifying and had some already thoughts about it or about in general um, tax relief. But it's also important right now because 70% of our city projected budget is based off of property taxes. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to know if we're going to extend these payment plans, how does that impact our ability to pay our own bills on a regular basis? So I would love to have just simply said, let's do this, let's give five years, let's give 50%, all taken care of. I understand there's a lot of wheels and a lot of parts to this conversation. So I, I look forward to having that with all of you, with the assessor's office, with the law department. Uh, and hope, I know we will get to a reasonable tax plan for um, our, our residents of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I want to congratulate the maker on this order and ask, and uh, Councilor Edwards mentioned it in her closing remarks, but that we also include the elderly commission in this work because I think our um, seniors are particularly vulnerable um, to this and then um, adding the um, 
the, I think the greater awareness that we need to have of speculators when we are talking about vulnerable populations and ending up in this situation. So I'd ask that, and I also also ask that my name be added. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sabi George. Councillor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also would like to thank the maker. Uh, and just to add to what has already been said, such an important issue, particularly for our seniors. I am currently dealing with a similar case, um, not a mental health issue, but a woman, uh, one of my constituents who is elderly, 82 years old, who has found herself in a, a similar situation in terms of owing back taxes to the city. I think it's very important that we think about how we can work with our residents to pay off this debt, but also that we think about some tax relief. I think I brought this up maybe yesterday or the day before in one of the budget hearings, you know, maybe rethinking um, some relief for our seniors in particular. And I do know that that has implications in terms of the revenue that we're bringing in, but I think that's an important part of the conversation. Um, finally, uh, would please add my name. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Janey. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Janey, Councillor Baker, Councillor Siomo, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn, Councillor McCarthy, Councillor Malley, Councillor Presley, Councillor Wu, Councillor Zakem, as well as the Chair. Councillor Siomo, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a, a very important issue. I have a very similar story as well. There's an abandoned property uh, in, in a very residential neighborhood. Uh, we're trying to get ISD to secure it. Uh, through, through some efforts from my office, we've discovered that uh, the father of a mentally Ill, Ill young man just recently passed away. Um, I'm working with the police department to try to find this young man. He's, he's got mental illness. It's a, a huge asset, to your point. It's a huge asset that could go to his care and custody. Mm -hmm. And uh, until and unless we find out where this young man is, it's gonna to continue to uh, pile on liens and tax arrears, and we should have a way to make sure that that, that um, asset goes to his care and custody. I don't, I'd just re like to remind folks though that every elderly, uh, there is a tax deferral program through, through the assessing department where it's uh, people over 65, and uh, we try to lower it to 55, where elderly, can defer their tax payments upon the sale, and it's actually a 4% uh, charge of interest that accrues. I brought it up to the assessor yesterday that I've read recently that Newton only charges a 1% interest on that, and I think we should look at that as well. Uh, so I applaud the maker. I want to add my name and look forward to the hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Siomo. I think we've already added Councillor Siomo's name, Madam Clerk. Yes. Um, at this time, docket 0626 will be assigned to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, for docket 0627, Councillor Edwards, as well as the Chair, withdrawing that. Um, and just for the public's sake, um, we were going to discuss a resolution to support something up at the State House, but it has been withdrawn up at the State House. So obviously, we'll continue our efforts in this regard when it comes to CPA. Moving on to docket 0628. Docket 0628, Councilors O'Malley and McCarthy offer the following order for hearing to discuss reestablishing the Boston Youth Cleanup Campaign Program. Council O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is a refile from last year. I am delighted to once again partner with my good friend and colleague, neighbor from District, Six, District 5, Councilor McCarthy, uh, who himself ran this program under Mayor Menino. Um, Councillor Flynn, when we introduced this last year, I think at least five members of this body <laughs> spoke uh, lovingly about how your dad, the former mayor, gave them their first job either through this or through, uh, through another program. Um, I actually never was a red shirt. I was interning for a former at-large counselor in my teenage formative years, but many of my friends were. The red shirt, pro red shirt program, the BYCC, Boston Youth Cleanup Corps, was something that uh, was incredibly successful, beginning with Mayor Flynn, carried under Mayor Menino, and then it stopped in, I believe, 2003 or four. Council McCarthy will let us know. Um, and essentially what it is, it's, it's a youth summer job program for kids, for teens, for young people. Um, where they work with the Department of Parks and Recreation, Department of Public Works. Uh, I mentioned this this morning at the West Roxbury Business and Professionals Association. I think our Main Streets districts are people who would love to see this activated, perhaps offer some revenue stream to try to pilot this. Um, but it's a great program. 
teaches young Bostonians uh, the great the great rewards of a hard work with tangible results you can see. Obviously, there are enormous benefits to our communities, to our neighborhoods, if this is done right. So once again, we're asking for a hearing order. Um, I will also continue to use this budget process to push for this. I think it uh, makes sense to perhaps look at a piloted program for this year. Uh, but again, delighted to work with my dear partner, friend, Council McCarthy, on this and uh, invite you all to reminisce of your first job with the city of Boston <laughs> or elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Council O'Malley. Council McCarthy, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President, and uh, thanks, Councilor O'Malley. Um, yeah, the red shirts go way, way back, and uh, this really comes down uh, earlier when uh, Councilor O'Malley and Councilor Janey uh, offered 0624 uh, regarding uh, addressing summer violence. You know, um, a lot of people, some may be too young in this group now to uh, remember the, <laughs> yeah, that's sad, um, but uh, the Boston Miracle. Uh, you know, the Boston Miracle where no kids between the age of uh, 12 and 18 were killed an entire summer. Um, you know, that wasn't a miracle at all. It was a lot of hard work. So, you know, so working with, um, working with re uh, reverends and nonprofit organizations, um, you know, we had tied everything tightly in a knot. Uh, we ran out of money. Uh, but at those times, uh, and I always laugh because I see Clerk Feeney looking at me and she always used to call for more red shirts because there wasn't enough red shirts in Dorchester. You could have, like, conquered a country with the red shirts in Dorchester. But <laughs> there was always room for more. Um, but the, the positive impact that uh, the cleanup corps made on the city uh, was really second to none. And I think as we drive through our districts and you see uh, the small islands uh, that may have some debris, you know, we just don't have the, the men and women uh, to pick up uh, every single piece of paper in the city. It just doesn't work out that way. Yet, um, those generations of kids who were red shirts, I guarantee you there was a, a feeling of possession. Uh, they owned that park. So when somebody broke a bottle, it was like, hey, 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 my park, not yours. So it, it was a, a very positive uh, impact on a lot, a lot of kids. And it's also the soft skills, showing up on time, dressing appropriately, making sure you have your ID, leaving on time, signing in, signing out. The soft skills we take for granted, um, there's a generation that don't take those for granted anymore. And then as, uh, as Matt had uh, stated, uh, the winter work program was also very successful. It was small, but it's successful. And uh, those are your fire hydrants. You'd be giving out a lot of, uh, a lot of gift cards to JP Licks. But um, uh, pedestrian ramps, bridges that we just can't get to. And uh, a, couple of summer, a couple of winters ago, we had the 118 inches of snow. Um, you know, I used to do that. I missed out on all that overtime. I took this job first. <laughs> Big mistake. But, um, you know, the men and women of the Boston Public Works Department and the contractors were working 70, 80 hours in a row. And uh, they, don't have the, they, they don't have the energy, never mind the manpower, uh, the people power to, uh, to take care of those handicap ramps. And, that's something else that this program can delve into. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, I know that this is one hearing that is my sweet spot, so I can't be fibbed to on this side of the table. I know everything uh, that has to do and has to go into it, so uh, they, they better be prepared. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Councilor McCarthy. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I just want to thank Councilor O'Malley, Councilor McCarthy, especially Councilor McCarthy for the great work you've done uh, administrating this program many years ago. Um, talking to Councillor O'Malley earlier about this program, and we were talking about jobs and the, the dignity of work. We were talking about the best social program is a job. I think with these young people, you're teaching them responsibility, you're teaching them professionalism, hard work, dignity of work, and it also it pays bills for many struggling mm -hmm. families. So I'm, I'm proud to sign on to this, um, to this as well. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Flynn's name, as well as Councillor Baker, Councillor Siomo, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Janey, Councillor Presley, Councillor Rue, Councillor Zakum, as well as the Chair. Docket 0628 will be assigned to the Committee on City, Neighborhood Services, and Veterans and Military Affairs. Uh, personnel orders. Docket number 0629, Councillor Campbell offered the following order. Uh, the chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0629. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0629 has been passed. Docket number 0630. Councilor Campbell for Council McCarthy. Uh, Council McCarthy seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0630. All those in favor say aye. aye. 
Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0630 has been passed. Docket number 0631, Councilor Campbell for Councilor McCarthy. Councilor McCarthy seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0631. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0631 has been passed. Docket number 0632, Councillor Campbell for Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0632. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0632 has been passed. Um, I'm informed by the clerk that there is one late file matter, which in the absence of objection will be added to the consent agenda. Hearing and seeing no objections, the uh, late file matter is added and it's a personnel order. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could read it. Thank you. On April 20th, 2018, Council Campbell offered that effective Saturday, April 28th, 2018, the following. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the first late file matter, or the only late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The first late file matter has been passed. Um, I'm Anybody wishing to remove anything from the green sheets may do so at this time. Nope. Um, moving on to the consent agenda, there actually may be two. two. I'm informed by the clerk that there are two late file matters to be added to the consent agenda, which in the absence of objection will be added. Seeing and hearing no objections, the two late file matters have been added. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The consent agenda has been adopted. Um, anyone looking to make a statement? Uh, Council Mallet, for what purpose do you rise? Ask for unanimous consent to make a brief statement, Madam President. Regarding? Uh, regarding in memoriam. <laughs> Thank you, Council yeah. Mallet. Um, I think some of you have known it happened early today, and I don't know that we got a closing memory of resolution, but uh, Lana Jones passed away this morning. Um, she was no stranger to this chamber. Uh, she, I would often greet her with a smile because she really covered a lot of what the council does. And uh, she was a legendary WBZ radio uh, reporter, had this incredible, this great voice. Um, I think she, in the early 90s is when she began her career. And it was a shock, it was sudden. I, I'm friends with her husband on Facebook and he wrote that she just came home last night and didn't feel so well and went to bed and woke up this morning and had a, a heart attack and ultimately God. succumbed to that. But um, she was a wonderful woman and a great reporter and fair and tough and thorough. And um, we're going to really miss her, particularly in this body. She did a great coverage of city politics, of city government, and um, just our thoughts go with her fam to her family and obviously her colleagues at WBZ Radio. So I just wanted to make sure that as we do our closings, we include Lana Jones, uh, legendary WBZ reporter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Council Malley. Anyone else wishing to speak? Um, before I move on to the memorials, I just want to quickly remind my colleagues that I'm hosting a lunch for all of you in the um, curly room. It should not last more than like 45 minutes. I understand you have busy lives, so um, you should be hungry, so join. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like all guests um, and my colleagues and counselors to please rise as we adjourn today's meeting in memory of the following um, individuals. Uh, for Councillor Baker, Susan Chisholm, and Dan Chisholm, for Councillor Asabi George, Robin Rist, John Sullivan, for Councillor Flaherty and Councillor Siomo, Dorothea and Anthony, for Councillor Flaherty and Councillor Flynn, William Stoddard, for Councillor McCarthy and Councillor Wu, Barbara Baxter, for Councillor Wu, Caroline Chang, and Leanne Osborne, and for all councillors, Barbara Bush, as well as Lana Jones from WBZ Radio. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. At this time, the chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of the aforementioned individuals. Um, we're scheduled to meet again on Wednesday, May 2nd at noon in this chamber at Boston City Hall. All those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The council is adjourned. That's what I just heard. I don't